morning, everybody. It is awesome to be with you uh, this morning. For those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Tom McGurk. My wife and I uh, were sent from this amazing family of believers here in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. We were sent three years ago to help serve the, ch the church in, uh, in Paris, France. And, uh, and we're so grateful to be home. I hope you feel at home this morning. It is great to be together, isn't it? Uh, just uh, so incredible. My, my, my wife, my, my son, Mateo, my daughter, Luna, uh, would have loved to see you this morning. They were there this morning at the 9 o'clock service. If you want to see pictures, Miss McGurk on Instagram. You know, that's my, my wife's. You, you, you can... You can keep up to date with everything going on. That's how I keep up to date with what's going on. Uh, and so, you know, you can get as many photos as you'd like. Uh, you know, keep in mind there is the Instagram filter. So it's not always roses and daisies. But, um, but it is awesome to be with you. I'm so excited. I have this, this lesson is extremely on my heart. Uh, it's something that, uh, you know, I've been studying for a couple months now. I'm so excited to share it with you today. But it makes sense on your Independence Day that you would invite a Frenchman to preach because I'm pretty sure that you guys needed a little bit of help, you know, to get, uh, get that independence you were looking for. So, okay, I am American. I was born in Paris, France, uh, but I'm American. But, you know, you know, to keep it fair, you know, we might be all speaking German in France right now if it weren't for your guys' help. So we're, we're in it together. We're a family. I hope I, I hope by offending all of you, I've offended no one. Um, and, uh, but it's, uh, it's great to be together. I know from what I understand, you guys have been talking about practicing the way. And, um, and today we're going to talk about practicing the way of community. We're going to talk about community today, and uh, this title is meant to catch your attention, okay? And so ho hold on there with me, but the title for today is Your Body is Not the Temple of God. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's get in our Bibles and I'm super excited about it. You know, oftentimes when I think about my body is a temple, often when I hear that context, I, I think about the guy who's been at the gym every day, and he's like, you know, I got to take care of this temple. You know, I got I to gotta get my protein or whatever, and you know, because this body's a temple. You know, nothing, nothing wrong, nothing bad, nothing impure comes into this body. Maybe you've heard someone say, no, I don't smoke because my body is a temple. Or, you know, I'm vegan or I have this diet because, you know, I just really want to take care of this temple inside of me. Now, those all may be good things to do, good practices. I'm not trying to bash any of you, but I am here to tell you that the, in context of those passages, they speak nothing to those things. If you want the, the Bible to help you on those areas, feel free to look at passages on self-discipline, laziness, addiction, greed, uh, the word pharmaceia in the Greek, gluttony, debauchery, folly, and a lack of self-control. There are many passages that speak to those issues. You don't need your body is a temple to justify not smoking or eating well or those types of things. But that's often how it's used. Let's look what the, let's see how the Bible uses the term, your body is a temple. We're going to look at a passage in Ephesians 2, verse 19. No slides, guys. We're, de we're deconnecting from this technological world right here. Just you and me, except for those of you who are living with me. Hi, love you. Uh, I hope you have your Bibles. We're going to look at Bibles on our phones or in paper. Uh, Verse 19 of Ephesians 2, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives 
by his Holy Spirit. You know, I love living in France. My wife and I, uh, we really enjoy being there. It's, it's filled with challenges and difficulties, being a foreigner and a stranger. You know, every day when I walk out my door, I feel uncomfortable. I have to prepare myself for the humiliation that is learning a new language. I mean, I know that within 10 words, the person listening to me knows I'm not from here. And it just, it just is what it is. You know, I've been preaching in French now at church for the last two years, and every single lesson comes with an, some sort of categorical error. I've said some incredibly bad things by accident in French. I'm not going to recount all the stories, okay? But I'm just, if you want to ask me later, I've said some things that I've just, I, I didn't, I, they've never even uttered, like exited my mouth in English, and yet I'm saying them in a different language. And I always see the faces, and I go, what have I done? And I just kind of got to fight through it. But one thing I have learned is, uh, is this idea of the word you, oftentimes in English, loses some serious meaning. We're going to talk about the difference between you and y'all, okay? <laughs> We're going to talk about the difference between you and y'all, okay? In French, if you want to say, brother, you are incredible. Frère, tu es incroyable, okay? That's how tu es incroyable. Tu is the you, okay? But if I want to say y'all are incredible, I would be like, les gars, vous êtes incroyable. Vous êtes. It's a different word to say you, but it's you plural. And the same thing exists in the Greek. That the Greek does you singular and you plural. In Old English, you had ye, you know, which, which signified, and there was different ways that the plural and the singular you was protected. But in our modern English, we lose sometimes the meaning of you. There's, there is a way to say you to mean us or to mean me. And as we look at this first passage that speaks about the temple of God, you'll look and you'll see that, and in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And that you is not about you. That you is plural. And it's very clear because then after that he says you're being built together to form a temple, a dwelling in which God's spirit resides. You know, if you really think about it, when if you say I, my body is the temple of God, it's a little bit illogical and a little bit arrogant. Here's what I mean, okay? Jesus, like our Savior, is a cornerstone. The apostles and all the prophets create the rest of the foundation. And then me, I'm the temple. <laughs> me in myself as an individual, I show the glory of God that is the temple of God. Doesn't really make much sense when you read it that way, does it? You know, here in this passage, it talks about this, this idea that we are built on something. And as we talk, the temple is built on God's word. You know, we live in a very, I don't know if you know this, this might offend you, but Western culture, American culture, French culture, a very individualistic society. Did you know that? Is it a shock to you? We live in a very individualistic society. But when we understand that actually we form the temple of God, that starts to change things. You know, sometimes we even want to be our own foundation. And yet this passage says, no, no, no. Not only are you not the temple on your own, but you're not the foundation. 
We have to fight to keep God's word, the teachings of the apostles, the prophets, Jesus as our foundation. That is our temple. The foundation has already been laid. Be careful that you're not creating another one. Let's keep reading. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. You guys still with me? I'm not sure if I've convinced you yet. I think these next couple ones might help, okay? What, verse, uh, verse 15, chapter 6, 2 Corinthians. I did it backwards for you. What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and I will walk among them and I will be their people and they will be my, and I will be, no, and, and I will be their God and they will be my people. What do we see again? We see this idea of not me, but we are the temple of God. You know, why is that important? Here in this passage, he's speaking to this idea that we together need to be careful of what we allow in the temple of God. If you know 2 Corinthians 6, it talks about not being unyoked, uh, not being yoked with unbelievers, and this idea of being careful and understanding that it's important what we allow in our midst as a group, about who we allow in our midst, about what teachings we allow to keep the temple holy, to keep it different, to keep it glorious. You know, if you're attached to this idea of I am the temple, Revelations 21, as he describes this idea of a new heaven and a new earth, he actually, it's actually written that God and Jesus will be the temple. So you won't be forever if you're attached to it because God and Jesus will be the, the, the temple and we will be among them. We will be together. This is where I make my cultural reference to try and stay connected to the younger generation. He wants to be among us. And a lot of you guys don't even know what that means, but some of you do. Some of you do. You know, the glory of the temple was this idea of Jesus is not just in you, which is true, but he's with us. This idea of looking and joining the assembly, joining the community and having this, how will I see to God today with my brothers and sisters? You know, as you look back at the garden, as you look back at the tabernacle, as you look back at the temple, the goal was always to be with God, that God would be among us, and that he would be with us together in our midst. We're going to look at one other passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, Do you not know that you yourselves... You, plural, are God's temple. And that God's spirit dwells in your midst. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred. And you together are that temple. Again, we see this idea, this dream that God would be in our midst. You know, the Spirit is in you, but you're also surrounded by the Spirit today. You know, why is this important? Why does this matter? Because sometimes we can incorrectly, because of our individualistic society, we can become so self-reliant. We can say, I am the temple of God. And what we say in thinking that to ourselves is I have everything I need. I'm fine on my own. I have the spirit in me. But my question for you is, does the brother or sister next to you 
have the Spirit in them? Because if they do, why is the Spirit in you more important than the Spirit in them? You know, this idea of if, yeah, you have all you need, but wouldn't you want more of the Spirit in your life? Absolutely. We see here that God's dream was for a sacred community. Not just a sacred individual, but a sacred community. Certainly, we play a role in our personal disciplines, right? Our personal, we bring holiness by being holy ourselves, correct? That clearly we have our own role, but do an exercise. Start reading the Bible, and when you see the word you, ask yourself, what type of you is he talking about? I have the plans. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Is he talking to you? He's talking to you. There's so many things that start to change when we start to think about how God really wants us to be together. You know, I got a question for you. Why did Jesus, our Savior, say, when two or more are gathered, there I'm with you also? Why didn't he start with one? Why didn't he say when one is with you, when you're, I'm with you? Now, clearly, right, I'm not trying to say that his eyes are not on the sparrow, that he doesn't know the hairs on your very head. Absolutely, but Jesus even himself was trying to highlight something, that you are better together, you accomplish my purpose together, that you cannot do it alone, this idea of valuing community. You know, now would be a good time to talk about what the temple back then, what functions did they serve? Let's look at it. I just wrote down a few, but do our, your own exercise. For me, as I've opened this up, it's become so much more fun to read the Old Testament, to see the way the temple was revered, the zeal people had to build the temple, and to now think, I can have that zeal to build the temple of God that I share. It's, it becomes incredibly exciting. But as I think about a few functions of the temple, it says, it was where you gave your first fruits in the temple. It was where you sacrificed unblemished sacrifices. It was where the holiness of God was exhibited. That people walked in and said, God is big, God is good, God is strong. It was where you were in the presence of God. It was meant to be from day one a light to the Gentiles, a hope for all nations so that they could all see the glory of God. It was where you found purification. It was a home to the priesthood. 1 Peter 2, you are a royal priesthood. It was meant to be your home. The temple was meant to be the home of the priest. You are that priesthood. Jesus himself, when he's lost and his parents can't find him, he said, Wouldn't, don't you know that I had to be in my father's house? It was home, the temple. It was where conflicts were resolved. It was where peace was restored. It was where all God's people celebrated multiple times of years for these big festivals and feasts. No matter where you came from, no matter where you were, you had to be there. You had to be there because God wanted everyone to celebrate together. It was where you practiced community. It was open 365, not just on Sundays or Saturdays or whatever. It was where adults continued in their learning. They grew, they exchanged, they didn't have Bibles in their homes. They had a Bible for a community of believers and they read it together. They shared, they exchanged, they encouraged, they challenged, they helped one another as a group of people. That's what happened at the temple. It was where God was worshiped and honored and revered. And it was where children learned to love God 
and to love his word. You know, I, I want to harp on that for a second, just a reminder to you parents. You know, I've got two now, and I remember what the sacrifices my parents made so that I would be in this community. I mean, the amount of times that I remember falling asleep in the car seat, waking up in my bed and being like, how did I get here? Because on my bit, way back from midweek or something like that, my parents picked me up or how many times my parents stayed late at a disciple's home just to encourage, practice community, to fellowship. And then I fell asleep on their couch and I woke up in my bed and kind of going like, how did I get here? And the destabilization of that. But it was amazing because my parents, because I had friends in the church, because my parents, they didn't just go to church on Sunday. They were with people and we practiced community. The, 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 what we did as a family, family devotionals, where we invited other disciples in our home. We read the Bible together. We sang together. It was where I learned all those things. As I got older, we didn't, I didn't have any disciples in, 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 uh, at my school. I had a best friend, John Buckles. He lived 45 minutes away. My parents made the sacrifice every Saturday to either his parents or mine, drove 45 minutes to go to his house, drop me off, and then drove back. And then after four or five hours, my dad would drive again 45 minutes to pick me up and then bring me back. Three hours of my dad's Sunday or Saturday in the car so that I could practice community. Because my dad knew that if I was gonna make it, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a community to raise up a family. And I'm terrified of who I would be as a parent if I didn't have other parents around me sharpening, modeling Christianity and parenthood. I need it. Your kids need it. Yeah, it's, it's hard having two newborns and, and, and managing their, their stresses and schedules and times and naps and all that, but kids are born in war. Like war times, like, and they manage, like in different nations, they're, they're literally like in war and they, they, they make it. And we can become so protective of our individual child that we forget that our child is not the temple of God, that he or she is going to need the temple She's, or he is going to need the we and it starts young. You better not be the only spiritual influence in your family. You better not be. You need a community. That's why I'm here today. John Buckles, my best friend, leads the church in Milan, Italy. My other best friend that lived 30 minutes away, Frank McDonald, leads the church in Prague, Czech Republic. And Courtney and I are in Paris, France. We were friends since we were six years old, and we are where we are because of the investment that those three families made in making sure that they didn't just have friends, that they weren't just popular or they're best in their sports, but that they had a spiritual community. That's what mattered most. You know, why does this matter? Why does this matter? It matters because if this is true, this was the good news. It was the fact that these functions of the temple are no longer predicated on a single place, but on just anywhere where there's an assembly of believers that have made Jesus Lord. Amen. That now all these functions that we see in the temple of God should and need to be practiced in every type of variant of community that we have, whether that be our small groups, our friend groups, our community groups, our church, our church family, our global church, that we should as a temple, one temple, that we should be helping one another fulfill these dreams that God has for his temple. This further emphasizes that we cannot do Christianity alone. Amen. That virtual service once a week is not enough. And neither is you coming on Sunday enough. It's a life of engagement. It's deep 
relationships. Not relationships that are bonded over what favorite thing that we have in common, but based on our Jesus that we have in common. When we say my body is a temple, we can sometimes be saying that we have everything we need to thrive. But it's much more about us than it is about you. Does this offend you? You might need to reflect on this. You might need to reconsider how do you view your need for those around you? You know, there's a reason why Christians really struggled with Copernicus when he said that the earth is not the center of the universe. Because we like to think that sometimes, that we are the center of the universe, but it's more than that. And maybe it's not that God doesn't love us as an individual. Maybe it's more that God knows that the way you thrive is when you focus less on me, 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 me. And that you become more like God when you think about others and not about yourself. That maybe it's because he knows that you do better when you think about yourself less. Is it possible that we've become a little too independent on this Independence Day? Have you become too self-reliant spiritually on this day? You know, when you struggle to believe that you are only the temple of God, leadership becomes very difficult to respect because acknowledging that anyone has something to offer you, to give you, to, to help you, becomes very hard. Humility in general becomes difficult because it's hard to listen if you think you know it all or that you have it all. You know, there's also this idea in our world right now that when someone hurts you, cut them off and get rid of the toxicity in your life. But if that person has the Holy Spirit inside of them and you just so quickly want to cut them off, that is absolutely toxic to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is grieved. It mourns because part of itself, himself, is being torn apart and there's not unity and that grieves the Holy Spirit. We don't cut people off. We fight to restore. We fight to build. That's how we're a light to the world. Like 1 Corinthians 3, it says we don't destroy the temple. We don't criticize. We don't just look and point. We see ourselves as equal members that have a role to play in building together the dream that that God has. You know, there's this idea sometimes in our, in our world that I have friends in the church. I don't need a small group. I don't need a community group. I've got some friends. You know, friends are selected, but community is given. And sometimes what happens when we only surround ourselves with the friends that enjoy us is we actually don't become more like God because we don't learn how to to, to work with people that have hurt us or that are different than us or that think differently than us. You know, that person that you're struggling with right now, do you believe that they have the Holy Spirit inside of them? If you do, then you should be fighting for peace, fighting to get resolved. It's not just about a few people. You know, if this is true, then no part of the temple can function on its own. You don't have a temple and then a few stones on the side. No matter how big, maybe you have a group of people, but if all of you guys have zero respect, zero appreciation for the church global, for the temple global, then you're not, you're not working in unison, building up the temple of God. The reality is that there's a lot of unity to be made and to be forged. I think about how hard it is to fight for unity. You have unity in your marriage, unity in your family, then you have unity with your friends, but then a small group. But then we don't want to just be small groups that function isolated, but we want to have maybe not as profound relationships as our community groups, but we want to have tethers to other community groups. We don't want to just be a church that 
is our own thing, but we want to be tethered and connected to churches around us. And that takes work and effort to appreciate that if this is true, the church in Paris is a part of the same temple. So we care about Paris. We care about the Bahamas. We care about Trinidad. We care about everywhere. We care about Athens. We care about every church here in the southeast because it's the same temple and we're striving together. I can't thank you enough for the sacrifices that you as a church continue to make in this season of giving. Courtney and I absolutely would not be able to be in Paris if it weren't for you. Absolutely could not, you know. And, uh, and I just thank you. And, and, and I know that that's a conviction of this church. This belief that we have to be generous and give, and we've got a lot of building to do everywhere, not just here. You know, sometimes there can be this fear of how can I really trust someone? What you're saying, Tom, is a repu- like a recipe for me to be manipulated. This idea that, you know, this person in front of me equally has the Holy Spirit? Are you telling me I have to listen to them? What if, what if we disagree? Well, that's where you have to go to the foundation and figure out what does God's word say. And if you're so afraid of being manipulated by them, even though they have the Holy Spirit, why aren't you equally afraid of being manipulated by yourself with the Holy Spirit that's in you? The the Spirit isn't different. It's the same. Yes, yes. We're not looking for codependence. We're looking for interdependence. We're not looking for control. We want to influence, inspire, encourage, exhort, admonish, warn, correct, rebuke. There are different things at different times for different circumstances. Those things we want to do. But if you do not value the Spirit of God in our midst, you will not be building up the temple of God. You will not thrive, and we will not be who Jesus, God, has dreamed us to be. We need each other. We need to listen more to one another. We need to value deep spiritual relationships. We need to build community, not just on Sundays, but through life. We need to live life together in such a way that serves all the functions of God's holy temple. I encourage you to take some time this year, sometime this year, to study the temple of God and figure out how you can be that, how we can be that together. Be careful of the you. Understand that God may be thinking much, much bigger and thank you, God, for it. You know, right now we're going we're gonna to take communion. We're going to pray. And Jesus never said to take communion by yourself. It was also a time that it was done together. And if you're with us virtually, you're, we're, we're together. We got to fight to stay together. And, and if you're there, not here physically, I pray that you have relationships that you're getting deep with, even if you're not here. And I pray that we can value this communion, this community that God so longs and dreams for. I love you guys. You are not, your body is not the temple of God, but we are the temple of God. Amen. Amen. Love you guys.